My guest today is Einar Volset with Tiny Seed. We talk about how Tiny Seed has deployed its first $4.5 million in capital across 23 companies and the returns that fund has made. We talk about why him and founder Rob Walling decide to create Tiny Seed to put $120,000 into companies and take 10 to 12% to equity as they help those companies scale. We talk about how Einar is thinking about raising fund two, what IRR he's promising to LPs, how much they're targeting to raise and what they're going to do with the money. But before that, we get into Einar's background, going all the way back to a northeast old mining town in England. We talk about how he then went on to co-found a company with a friend who was an ex-Googler. They built that company via YC and ultimately sold to Google. But that partner, for some reason, refuses to acknowledge that Einar was a co-founder. We'll talk more about that in the interview. We cover all of it. This is really an interview on how Tiny Seed works. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My guest today is Einar Volset. Starting back in 98, he was studying at Newcastle University, where he eventually, in 2005, earned his PhD in computer science. Between 2005 and 2007, he guest lectured at Cornell before jumping into in 2008 and finding an app called Remail with his co-founder, which later went through Y Combinator and eventually, a couple years later, sued, so, sold to Google. In 2009, he started a company called Left Coast R&D. And since then, he's worked on many different things, including in 2014, launching an app called app aftercare, which he eventually sold. He now in 2018 uh, launched a company called Discretion Capital, which is helping with SaaS M&A and also teamed up with Rob Walling to find Tiny Seed in 2018, an accelerator for B2B SaaS companies. Uh, and are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So take us back to a little bit of childhood history here. So, so where did you grow up? And was there like sure. some sort of specific game that your parents bought you that got you addicted to development and coding? <laughs> Actually, no. So I, I grew up in Norway and um, we had, I think my first computer was like a Commodore 64. My first programming I ever did was, was making it make a machine gun noise. That was sort of the first thing I remember doing. But then honestly, like I wasn't doing an awful lot of programming before I got to college. I did, um, <laughs> I was doing more sort of hanging out on BBSs, more sort of hacking phone freaking than anything else. What is that? I don't know what phone freaking is. Oh my God, I'm so old. Phone freaking <laughs> is this notion where like, it, 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 so, so it depends where you're going. It's like phone freaking is fooling the uh, telephone system to give you free long distance and international calls by emulating the audio noises that the, uh, that the system plays. Just you basically play it over the phone line and it gives you free phone calls. Wow. Um, what year, so what year was that? Ah, uh, this would have been hopefully statute of limitations ago. Ah, <laughs> uh, this would have been... Oh, early 90s, I guess, something like that. And you would have been about how old? Oh, I was 13, something like that. Okay, so that was your first kind of, you know, for, you know, getting to code, you get free long distance, you go, wow, if I learn how to, all this stuff works, I can get more free stuff. Yeah, pretty much. It was like, I didn't really get productive, like in terms of coding until, um, until college. That's really when I sort of, it picked up, kicked up for me and I, I was interested in it. In terms of like, I, I did very much the academic route. Like I did, I did pretty well uh, both in high school and college. And then um, sort of the, the, you know, you just, I think when you're, when you're younger, you sort of get good at school and then you sort of just follow that path. And then you know, some people aren't smart enough to stop. And so that was one, that was me who just ended up like, all right, well, if I'm good at school, like I'll take it to the extreme and become a, do a PhD. Um, and it was only really during my PhD, my master's PhD, that I was, I actually started listening, uh, started reading Paul Graham's work, uh, his essays on, you know, the startups and, and, and sort of opened my eyes to this notion that, oh, this is not this abstract thing that, you know, people who went to business school with fancy business plans do. This is like people like me can go and build their own business and it can be a meaningful, a meaningful outcome. So, so sort of a late bloomer as a, in terms of like, entrepreneurship you know i wasn't one of these kids who had a lemonade stand at five or whatever that was, mm -hmm. that was never me so what you talk about you know these kids that go through and they get really good at school and then they never turn their head up and go wow this could have practical applications outside of academia yeah. let me get out why didn't you have that moment why didn't you ever have a moment to pull your head up I, I think i think most of the time people do what they everyone else does you know <laughs> you, you do, you get praised for doing something, for going to school, good and getting good grades. And you think, well, you know, you get good grades, good grades in middle school. What do you do? Well, you go to high school, you get good grades. Well, if you get good grades in high school, what do you do? You try to get into the most competitive college. All right, you got into the best competitive college, you get amazing grades. 
then that's when most people are like, you know, I'm going to go out and make some money and, 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 you know, try a career. Whereas I was sort of just stuck on that. I was like, well, you know, I, I guess I needed to prove how smart I was. <laughs> what, what was the environment like in Newcastle in 2003, 2004, 2005? And was there an entrepreneurship club? Was there a program for entrepreneurship? What was the innovation ecosystem like back then? There, there really wasn't one. Although that being said, there's a couple of like, um, so Newcastle is, a, is an old mining town. Like the Northeast of England is quite economically depressed, or at least it was at the time. Um, and so, you know, like there, there wasn't, there wasn't a sort of a large amount of tech industries, although there were some, and there was some, some stories about like, um, I think Sage, the big sort of tech accounting type firm got founded by, in Newcastle. And there's actually a story about, I think when we were in undergrad, we had one of the founders come and talk to us. And, and that was, that was, I remember that, that was very interesting, but, but partly the, the most memorable part was one of the lecturers, one of the senior lecturers, or maybe he was a professor then, um, he was actually one of the co-founders of Sage and decided not to do that just because he wanted to, instead he wanted to still remain a lecturer at the university. So he turned down <laughs> being a founder at, uh, at Sage in order to become a lecturer at Newcastle University, which I think economically at least uh, was a mistake. When you're sitting there listening to one of the Sage co-founders give a lecture and they're, and they're obviously have some success at this point and they're talking about, you know, we, we potentially raise money or we have this much in revenue and you're sitting there going, you know, I don't know what your financial situation was, but I'm a college student trying to pay like college bills and get this damn PhD in your mind. I mean, I remember when I was still really cared about grades and I heard lecturers come in talking about like building a great company and money related things in my head, my excuse would be, Oh, I don't care about money. I'm going to keep getting good grades and, you know, valedictorian and be the best. And then at some point, I, I, I think there's some of that for sure. I mean, I think like <clears throat> to give you some more context, like it, it was pretty clear to me after I had been at Cornell for you know a couple of years, I didn't want to, I didn't want to become a tenure track professor. Uh, now, was I smart enough to do it? Probably not. But uh, even if I was, I, I wasn't that interested simply because I, I didn't, you know, it just wasn't for me, you know, there's, it's great for some people and, but there was an awful lot of academics who were pretty unhappy, <laughs> put mm -hmm. it that way. And also like one of the things, but, but anyway, once I decided to do that, then um, it, it's funny how people treat you because I almost got treated like I was like a death in the family, you know, <laughs> like if you're in CS academia, like, you know, high up and you decide to go to industry, even if you decide not to go to like pure industry, if you go into like industrial research, they almost feel people, you almost get the sense that people feel sorry for you. Like, Oh, you didn't quite make it, you know, not, not quite smart enough. So, okay, well, good for you. Like, you know, go do your thing. But, but you know, the real pinnacle of achievement is, is, you know, pure academic research. And, and that, that was one of the weirdest things about it. I was like, huh? Okay. That's interesting. Is that dangerous? Dangerous in what way? the pinnacle achievement of, of a system we've built is to get a, to get a degree that costs a lot of money that may or may not be tied to actual economic value in the world. No, I don't think it's dangerous. I mean, I think it's just, it's, it's funny how, what, to me, it speaks more to like people will do uh, pretty much what everyone else around them does. I mean, that's one of the key things. It's like, and, and I think, people think that their little piece of the world is much more important than it is most of the time. Like it's, or, or at least more impactful. I think like if you look at, and, and this is, I think this is true in every industry, like there, you know, in every sort of subculture niche and in industry, there are like famous people, you know, the people, everybody knows, you know, X, Y, Z, right. It doesn't matter which industry you're in. There's always somebody who's who like, was that for you when you were guest lecturing in 2005 at Cornell? Oh, there are a bunch of people. I, I, I'm really bad with names, but there's, there are some people who are like, you know, there, there's that Stanford professor. There's a Stanford professor who, who gave up email and the only way to, to reach him is to send him a physical letter. Or if someone sends an email, then his, his like assistant prints it out once a quarter and then he responds via, you know, something like that. And, and there are a number of sort of sages in, in the academic world. And that's also true in, you know, in startup land. Like, look, everybody knows who Paul Graham is, you know. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Um, but... If you go outside the sort of software startup world and you go talk to the world's best, you know, lawyers, do they know who Paul Graham is? No idea. It doesn't matter. You know, like, you know your relationship to Paul Graham or, or who he is or whatever doesn't matter at all. And that, I think that's true for every single industry. I'm sure it's true for lawyers, too. I'm sure there are like superstar lawyers that every single lawyer knows and wants to become. But uh, you wouldn't know who they are. I have no idea. Well, so did you have that idol in college? 
uh, no, not really. It's just more like my point is more like these people, like people do what everyone around them d- typically does. And that's how you end up on a given path. And I think it's actually quite unusual to stop and go. And this is probably why I like startup people, because usually they've had to do that in order to decide to become startup people. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> most people I know who are in the startup world, they have a brother or, you know, friends or, you know, most of their friends and family aren't in startups. You know, they're in, you know, they became accountants or lawyers or, you know, construction crew or whatever. And, and it's, it's the person who had to sort of stop and say, you know, I want to do this completely different thing, much higher risk. And, and yeah, I think that's special. So when you, when you graduated Newcastle in 2005 and then agreed to guest lecture at Cornell between 2005 and 2007, I think what you would have been early, late 20s, early 30s at that point? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Why did, why, so after you graduated at Newcastle, what excited you about guest lecturing at Cornell? What I'm digging for here is when the transition moment was between academic a r and startup a r <laughs> So that that definitely wasn't the transition. Like the transition to Cornell was was sort of a step up because Newcastle is a great university, but Cornell is a top you know top five, top ten university in the world in computer science. And so it was for me, it was um, it was sort of a step up to sort of the next level. It was a sort of continuation after my PhD. I did really well with my PhD, and so I got a you know a visiting assistant professorship at Cornell. So I was like, great, this is a stepping stone to whatever. I, like I said, I didn't really think about it at a very at a holistic level. It just, this is the next step. And it was obviously prestigious. And it was obviously like very similar to graduating middle school with a, or graduating high school with a great grades and getting into an amazing college. It was very okay. similar. So following this logic forward, which is, this is what everyone else is doing. I want to go be the best at it. I get a PhD. I go at the next level and I guess lecture at Cornell in 2007, you didn't take the next step, which is full-time work yeah. towards tenure path. What happened? Yeah. Because I realized that a bunch of profess- tenure track professors are really miserable. <laughs> and even the ones who are tenured, they don't seem that happy. Like most of the time, and there are exceptions, but a lot of the time what you end up doing as a, as a professor, like a tenured professor, is you don't actually, so people get into academia. And I, the piece I liked was doing actual research and like coming up with new things and testing them out and, you know, seeing. Um, <clears throat> but if you actually become a tenured professor, you don't actually do very much of that. <laughs> most of the time if you if you want to become a and here's my recipe for becoming a successful professor be amazing at, at writing grants um like that's basically the main job like people underestimate particularly in the u.s but also elsewhere how similar uh being a professor is to being a startup like a venture-backed startup founder because essentially what you're doing all the time is going out grabbing money getting the best people and <clears throat> trying to get your projects, you know, financed, built and done and, or published in the case of academia. Mm-hmm. So what happens to ap- those people? And I was like, yeah, this, this is not for me. And, and like partly also is like I needed to be sort of closer to impact. Like, I think that's part of the problem is you look at some of this research that gets done and you're like, what, like, this is an interesting academic challenge, like an interesting mental, um, you know, problem and, and difficult and all that stuff. But is like, what is the use case? Like very often it's like, uh, it has to be such a convoluted set of uh, situations for this, for the restrictions that have been put in place on the problem to apply that it's, it's such a narrow set of things that it can apply to. That's part of the problem. I have. Like I did my PhD in or something called mobile ad networks, which are, <clears throat> okay, imagine that you don't have any kind of wireless infrastructure. You just have a bunch of, well, most of this was military, uh, military funded. So you just basically imagine you have a bunch of Humvees just driving around the desert and all they have is peer to peer communication. And they're sort of, you know, not everyone is in reach of everyone else. How do you, how do you communicate? Like, how do you share data in, in, in the appropriate way? And I could, I could nerd out about this, but realistically, like how often is the, is there such a case where there is no wireless infrastructure and you can't put one up and there's probably no satellite? Like, has an extremely low number of cases. Because like even, you know, like even when, you know, the U.S., you know, ran into Iraq, fair enough, they didn't have, you know, base stations with them then, but they just had, you know, mobile base stations, basically, and overhead AVAX flights and things. So the actual use case for that particular uh, domain is, is quite narrow, even though it produces a lot of interesting and challenging problems academically. 
let me yeah. dig on, let me go on that for a second. I all of us saw the incredible work Elon Musk just did this past week. Mm-hmm. And when he was interviewed prior to the launch, uh, first successful American astronauts, American soil, uh, American aircraft. But he, one of the things he said, business model wise for space, uh, is obviously, you know, cargo delivery, uh, right. And then it's transportation to Mars and the moon. And then it's commercial flight, people like you and I buying tickets. Well, one of the early payloads that he's been putting in space is essentially launching Satlink, right? Thousands and thousands yeah. of satellites floating up there to essentially deliver and internet to places right now where governments can't deliver it or it's not affordable. Uh, I'm getting way out of my league here, but I imagine satellites floating up on earth, they need to use something you touched in your PhD research to communicate to each other and, you know, do this sort of thing, even if it's not an Iraq invasion with, with, you know, no wireless infrastructure. Potentially it's the similar stuff. This is is typically they're stationary, the satellites. And so um, in that case, yeah, you might form a mesh network between the satellites in order to, you know, um, in order to coordinate on certain things. But again, it's a slightly, it's a slightly convoluted problem. And it's also like, well, if they're going to be stationary, chances are you could just put some base stations in strategically placed and you'd solve 99.9% of the problems. But where, um, where would you put a base station in space? No, no. What I mean is like, if you need to communicate, if you need to coordinate with the, uh, between the satellites, you're probably better off just having all the satellites communicate down to earth and then have a central point where you can do all the coordination and send it back up again, rather than effectively trying to have a peer-to-peer network in space. Because um, that's not going to be as effective, I don't think. Although mm-hmm. I haven't thought much about it. But yeah, I mean, every now and again, something comes up and I'm like, eh, I could potentially have used this specific weird algorithm stuff. That and I spent so, that I so, where we spent. Spe- I'm like, <laughs> half an hour later, I'm like, no, actually, there's a much easier, faster, and better solution, which doesn't require any of this, you know? Yeah. So, what happened to AR after Cornell? Uh, after Cornell, um, like physically or like mentally, the shift away from academia? What are you asking me here? Both. <laughs> well, I wanted to do something else. And so, part of the Paul Graham's writings was a, was a big part of it. Um, and then, what I Sorry, did. what was, was a big part of it? Paul Graham's writings, his essays. Yeah. And so I then did, um, uh, I went to Vancouver for a bit uh, in Canada, worked at a, a startup there. And then uh, my wife actually got into UC Santa Cruz. And I came down here and it was, you know, September time, late September. And it was, you know, 75 degrees and sunny and it had been raining nonstop in Canada for like six weeks. And I was like, all right, I'm moving. <laughs> was, uh, was your wife the only person in Newcastle that beats your, beats your PhD score? <laughs> but she actually she has a she she nearly has she has an abd phd in english like she has everything but the dissertation in english so <laughs> how'd you guys meet to be called doctor <laughs> how'd, how'd you guys meet was it at school at college yeah i mean first second year of college amazing and then why so you went to vancouver but she went to santa barbara directly or the santa cruz mountains directly no we both went to santa uh, so, so the deal was this like i moved to cornell for my job and then um she came along and then I was, I was like, all right, well, you got to get a call next. If you could do anything, what would you want to do? And she, she's an artist. Um, and so she wanted to do this science illustration course at, uh, UC Santa Cruz. And I said, well, why don't we do that? And so she applied and she applied when we were in Vancouver and then she got in. And originally the plan was for her to go down and do it. It was a year long program and then come back to Vancouver because we liked Vancouver despite the rain. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the company I was I was working with was going sideways in a pretty spectacular fashion. Which um, company was that? I would rather not discuss it. <laughs> that was like, my gosh, that must have left some marks. That was almost a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. I mean, like we did. So, so the con- we had some interesting stuff there. We actually had the first. Um, we had the we had the fire hose access to all the tweets in the world. Like we were one of the companies who had all the. The, the Twitter firehose access. And we did a bunch of stuff that was quite interesting. We had, we'd actually built out a, um, a search engine and a basic recommendation engine for Twitter before Surmise existed. And Surmise was one of the companies they acquired like two or three years later. Um, but it was, yeah, it, it was, there was some issues with that company mm-hmm. as like, as, a, as, 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 as always, I think yeah, in startup land. Uh, well, there, there are all kinds of issues. Sometimes there are people issues. Sometimes it's actual technology issues. There's a difference in product roadmap vision. And sometimes there's just conflicts between, you know, investors and the board or things. Can you kind of categorize the issue? I would say all of the above. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Is the company still operating today? We, no, 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 no. Oh, they're Okay. No, no, no. It folded. I think, uh, I think it folded six months after I left or something. Okay. Oh, I thought you said they acquired some eyes. 
No, no, no. Twitter acquired some eyes. Oh, Twitter uh, acquired some eyes. engine for Twitter two or three years later. But what I'm saying is that company actually had a prototype version that was as good, I think, as Sumai's two years earlier. <laughs> Interesting. And that company had the one you worked at had raised venture capital. Yes. Was that your first experience working in this ecosystem of there's a VC, I have to, you know, pander to a yep. board that, okay. And did you learn anything from that or kind of early, early signs? Yeah. Your investors are important. Like, <laughs> Like um, the money is, is like, if you give a lot of control to an investor, you have to make sure that they are, you are all aligned about what you're trying to do. So I think, I think some of the problem with, and, and like stepping away from this company in general is, I think some of the reason why um, places outside of things like Silicon Valley struggle to establish themselves, there's like everybody wants to be Silicon Beach or Silicon Slopes or Silicon Lake or Silicon whatever, right? And, and part of the problem is, is that, um, uh, the people with money in Silicon Valley typically made it doing early stage startups, you know, and, and they, they, so they understand it versus people in places like, you know, you know, Vancouver or Chicago or, you know, DC made their money elsewhere. And that can sometimes be a problem. Like, you know, they don't, they, they just don't have the sort of nose for it. Like they don't know what to, they put too much money into the wrong thing and too little money into the other thing. They grab too little control when they should be grabbing some more and they, and they, and they take way too much control in some cases. And, and, and that can really mess up, um, mess up a company in terms of, you know, incentives and things like <clears throat> there are several stories of sort of friends of mine and we've been in a position where, it, you know, an investor, and, it, and it's partly like, you know, both sides problem, but they haven't been able to early on establish like, okay, you provide the money for how much, how much control do you get? And so when they start to talk about this, like six months or 12 months in, maybe when they have their first few paying customers, like the mismatch can be phenomenal. Like the, the, the founder can think that it's probably worth 10, 15%. And the investor can think like, what do you mean? Like you just built the thing. I gave you all the money. I should have 90%. <laughs> Why is that vague? I feel like that's pretty standard. I mean, that's very clear in any safe you look at today, any convertible note, even a priced early seed round. That's all very clear. Yeah, but but you have to understand, like, not everybody follows those outside of like this the sort of established ecosystems. Not everybody follows those like standard paper trail stuff. And, and a lot of the time, these companies are, you know, the funding structures are kind of vague to start with. It's more like, hey, I want to build this thing. Like, maybe you, the investor is in fact just paying the salary for somebody on their team for eighteen months mm -hmm. while they're doing something without really establishing any kind of formal, even corporate structure. Mm -hmm. um, in order to get it done. And that can be like, you can be in a position where like they built something cool. Now they need to go raise some more money in order to, to really grow on, but they don't actually, all right, they aren't able to because they, the investor wants to own, feels like they should own 90% of the company, which is, you know, obviously untenable if you effectively were a seed investor. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Okay. So you leave that company in 2009. Yep you know, picking up then here next, uh, there was a gentleman uh, named, for those of you that are internet nerds, uh, named Paul Buhite, who was one of the early early developers, a lead developer really on the initial Gmail program. Uh, he worked with a gentleman named uh, Gabor Celli, uh, who was interning at Google at the time and, and also was working on the early days of Gmail. Uh, Gabor ended up leaving and in 2008 founded a company called Remail. And I believe, uh, Anar, your story collides with Gabor's at this moment. Yes, I was co-founder there. So, so walk, how did you guys meet? I don't even truly remember. It was sort of that one of those things is like, it, we would, partly I was, it was, I think Gabor wanted to get into Y Combinator and PG has a very strong attitude that you should definitely have a co-founder. So I think actually it was, it was Gabor who was actively looking for co-founders. Um, and so this is actually before, so I think Gabor, when I met him, he wanted to build, he wanted to build, I think he wanted to build an Outlook competitor for the desktop. And I definitely didn't. <laughs> I was going to say, in, in, in his letter, when he announced that Google acquired the company, he said, quote, we built three products, but the one that took off was an iPhone app for travelers that would download all your email to your phone for instant local search. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that was, it was me pushing hard. So I've been hacked because of the mobile ad hoc network stuff I told you about at Cornell. I've been hacking in and around the iOS SDK even before they did the uh, released a, uh, an official SDK. 
And so I was like, dude, the iPhone is the future. <laughs> and it still sounds funny to say that now because it so obviously was the case. But in you know, 2000, uh, 2008, that wasn't necessarily true. Like it was certainly as like people were still, you know, all the lawyers were still wearing black, you know, wearing Blackberries. All the Wall Street guys were wearing Blackberries. And so, um, you know, I, I think, I, from, I mean, this is like haze of history now, but I think I'm the one who pushed for like, we should do something on the iPhone. And we did that. And we, it was, you know, it was interesting, actually. I think we were just a little early. I think there's a company that's uh, called, I think, Mailbox. They were called, they were, I think they're acquired by Microsoft for like, ludicrous amounts of money but they effectively did what we did but then we're smart enough to set up a uh, uh um a wait list system they were one of the first people who did this thing like you get on the list you have so many people in front of you invite five people and you get to you know join the thing which is super standard now but that was pretty innovative one of the problems we had was that um yeah it was kind of challenging to download your entire email inbox onto a, an early version you know early iphone version um, we'd have to be in a situation where we inst the instructions were to leave the app running. And remember, there was no background processing at time. So you'd have to be in the foreground to do anything. So we had to be like, plug the phone in, leave the app open, and then go to bed. And then hopefully it'll be done by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we we do that. But then, of course, we had no gating. So all of a sudden, you know, we got mentioned on TechCrunch, and then thousands of people downloaded the app. And it was just, you know, complete mayhem. Yep. Um, well, so what is this, you know, I'm putting my, my kind of Gabor hat on, which is, okay, I kind of, I leave Google. I'm now tinkering with this thing in 2008. Uh, I then, uh, get introduced obviously at YC, uh, in 2009 is really when the program I, I believe started. And then March of 2009 was, was the demo day. You became, according to your LinkedIn profile, profile CTO, uh, in January of 2009 at Remail. So three, four months before demo day. So what does it mean? I mean, he, it sounds like Gabor had already been working on this for, you know, call it eight to 12 ish months. What does it mean to be co-founder coming in that late? So we, I, we, we were working together before that. How so? We were just working on that before that. Uh, so at the time, my uh, immigration status was, let's call it a little unclear. So I wasn't about to put that I was, you know, working on any kind of official capacity uh, until I had to. Um, so yeah, but we met and started working on the iPhone stuff. It was me, Gabor, um, and another two guys. We've been working on that probably since, uh, I want to say October. Something like that the year yep. before. Yep. Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, what is the conversation that you guys have? Gabor's going, listen, Anar, I love working with you. Paul's not going to let us in the program unless they have an official like co-founder. We've got to figure out this immigration thing and get you officially listed. Yeah. I'm, we didn't care that much about what LinkedIn was. I, I think we were just trying to, it, 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 partly he was just trying to build a team. I was interested in working on it. And, you know, it was me and him who was working on it initially. Um, his, I think the other guy who helped us was actually a medical doctor in Germany. And he was like, he thought of it as like a holiday. I was like, I'll come and work for nothing for like six months just because I want the experience of working on a tech startup in Silicon Valley. <laughs> he was always going to go back to Germany and be a doctor. So, mm -hmm. so what is, I guess what I'm looking, there's people right now that go through this exact same prob process, but usually the, the, the setup is it's a business guy or gal with a great idea. And they go, man, if I could just incentivize a CTO to come join me, we would like make a bunch of money. Now you were a little yeah, different no, no, because no. Gabor, I mean, Gabor that, that was, wasn't he, he, if he, just to wrap up the question, I mean, he was a programmer already. You were sure. also a programmer. You spoke the same language, right? So I guess what I'm, the question I'm trying to get to is, when when you and Gabor have the conversation of you coming on essentially in, in a full time role, there has to be an equity conversation there, obviously, right? So do you guys just say we're going to split it fifty fifty, or how do you have the equity? Um, I don't remember exactly. I, he was majority, I was minority, is roughly what I think. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, I don't even remember. I mean, but does someone like, I mean, again, these are your, if, if you believe you're building the next great thing, you want to keep as much equity as possible while also incentivizing smart people to join, right? So in the bar said, he's going, what do I have to give uh, uh, A&R to get him excited? But also I want to keep as much as I believe this is going to be a big thing. I mean, do you, do you give a CTO that you're trying to convince to join more than 20% of the company? Uh, he did. Um, do I think that's a, the, the appropriate thing? I don't, I don't know. I think like... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. 
<laughs> well, why'd you say yes? I mean, you're coming off a PhD, successful guest lecturer at Cornell. You just mm-hmm. left an application that you learned kind of how to work in the startup ecosystem. And you're saying you're going to agree to something for less than 50%. Why not go start your own thing and have 100%? Well, I consider that too. I just thought that this was a, a better opportunity, I think. But why was that? I guess, I guess I had more confidence in this idea than my solo ideas. Okay, fair enough. So what March? We're March 2009 now. It's YC Demo Day. What happens? Uh, it's complete mayhem. I <laughs> seem to remember. Although at the time, it's actually kind of a blur demo day for me. There was just a shit ton of people. And I think we got, I want to say four minutes, which is, it doesn't sound very much per pitch, but I think now it's down to one minute per company. And it's just, it's just a complete, you know, go out, pitch, do this stuff, get more money. It's because that's what YC is about, right? Like once you get demo day, success is defined as like you raised a, another round. But also keep in mind, like this was 2008, no, 2009. <laughs> Like I was talking to um, actually guys, a friend of mine who's, um, who's a venture capitalist now and, and was then, and he was actually a demo day. And, and um, he said, actually, the, the weird thing about that demo day is like the feeling going into it was, will anyone write any checks? <laughs> that was the, that was the feeling, you know, because like, 2008, you know, 2008, 2009, we, we did it with, uh, went through with Airbnb and <clears throat> they actually, um, just to give you a context for, for how things have changed, they did uh, what they then called their Series A, which later got rebranded as a Series C because there wasn't such a thing, I think, as a Series C at the time. But they raised six hundred thousand dollars for their Series A, and like everybody thought, like, holy crap, that's a lot of money, like you know that, and and that was a big check at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the sort of startup ecosystem, like there's a lot of these companies got started right around then, like Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe a little later. And they all got started in, at the time when the valuations were nowhere near as, flat, as, as, as highfalutin as they are now. So, so what was the status of, of Remail kind of post YC or even pre and post YC? I mean, do you, were, you guys, were you guys pre-revenue still at this point? Yeah. So they never really made a lot of money, like because it wasn't. Uh, I think maybe at, we, we, I think we tried. I'm, now I'm just clutching at straws of my memory here. I think we tried charging like five bucks for it. Maybe there was no such thing as subscriptions at the time. Mm-hmm. We tried. I think we tried in like the second product because the the, the version between like the desktop version and the the, the sort of quote unquote final version was one which is sort of a hybrid where like there was an app, but it talked to like a central server and we were going to charge a subscription for the server. I think we tried that. Um, and then I think we tried, I think we tried charging for the app itself just, but not, not much like five bucks per account or something like that. It, it, it never was a real focus to, mm-hmm. to, to try to make it super sustainable. In terms what of- was people would say North star metric today and freemium apps are like user growth or like, you know, activation or things like that. What was your North star metric in those days? We didn't have any. I mean, like <laughs> this, is still, this is so early. You we were just like, well, we hope a lot of people use it and it becomes successful. That was sort of the, the extent of our, you know, extent of, of our other of metrics we were, we were using like that, like a bunch of people are using it. They can continue using it. It doesn't crash as much as it used to do. <laughs> and we get some mentions in, in press. That was sort of the main, the main metrics going into the fundraise post post YC. How many people use it at its peak? I have no, I have no idea. You just said it's one of your critical metrics. You must know. Yeah, I know. I don't know. No, I don't know actually. Uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, a thousand, a million. I'm thinking like, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand people at the very least. Okay. Like, you know, daily actives. That's what okay. I think. Okay. I'm not sure. So take us past what happened in the days after YC demo day. Did you guys end up raising capital or no? No. So me and Gabor decided that we were not the best fits person personality wise as co-founders. 
And so I, was we went say, I didn't, I didn't want to bring this up when you first said it, but like all the press related to the remail, it, it never says co-founder Gabor Chelly. It says founder Gabor Chelly. And the only time I could find your name related to the company was in the acquisition thank you letter that he wrote. And he said, I'd like to thank Fabian Siegel, Einar Volset, Sridhar Sarvanasan, Paul Bohm, and a couple other people, but I couldn't find your name anywhere else related to the tool. <laughs> yep. That's, that seems right. Yeah. Why, why did that tension exist? We were just very different personalities, um, I think. Like I came at it from, like he, you keep in mind like his background, like he came at it from, uh, you know, Google, like he was VP of engineering at Zobni, very successful there, like very process oriented engineering type. I came at it from uh, academia, so very like prototype heavy, let's just build something. Who cares about tests? Let's just throw this shit at the wall and see what sticks, and then we'll fix it later. Um, so I think that was the main sort of difficulty in us working together. Yep. So 2010, Google acquires the company. Now, I'm going to go on a limb here and say it wasn't a meaningful cash event for anyone because they basically shut it down before later in op open sourcing it. Is that a fair statement? I, I think that's a fair statement, yeah. Okay. And also keep in mind, this is 2010. And like... This is not like even valuations for, for very successful companies that you would now probably expect to sell for 100, 150, 250 million. We're selling for mid digits, mm -hmm. uh, millions, you know. You, you shared earlier, you, you had less than 50%, but more than 20% of the company. Did you personally make any actual cash from that deal or was it really more a, hey, come, you have the option, come work with us for a couple, you know, years, put Google on your resume sort of thing? Yeah, it was more the latter. Okay. So did you decide to do that? Did you decide to go work for Google? Uh-uh. Never worked for Google. <laughs> Never will. Why? That's a strong statement. I, uh, I just, I don't know. I don't like their, no, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. I have lots of friends who work at Google. Like, don't get me wrong, but that doesn't fit my, it's in general. Like I've never worked for a big company, you know, like not really. Like I guess Cornell is a big ish company, but yeah, no, the whole, the whole thing. And you know, like the role would have been, I guess, I guess the role would have been interesting. I don't know, but what would, yeah. what would your title have been? I have no idea. What would the role would have? What was the role? I don't know. <laughs> How do you know it would have been interesting if you don't know what the role was? I know lots of people are doing it. Like you, product manager role at a big company. I'm sure it's interesting. I don't know. I've just never done it. Interesting. So is it just a anti big company mindset for you, or was it something specific to like the process of how Google did you know their sprints? No, I just wasn't interested. Interesting. Okay. So what do you do? 2010, the company goes to, to Google. What is it? What does Anar do? Um, so I started just, uh, well, I bummed around for a while and then I started doing, um, left coast R and D, which was the company that's been around in the background. It was like a holding company still is around. Um, basically just started doing prototypes for, uh, for, cause this is the time when like everybody needed an app. Like this is like 2010, 2009, 2010, 2011 everybody wanted an app. And so, uh, people just came out of the woodwork, like mostly YC companies saying like, Hey dude, like you worked at Remail, Can you help us build this app for us? So I started doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did that. It's effectively consulting work for, you know, a number of years. For cash or were you getting little equity stakes in these companies you helped? Oh, cash. Yeah. God, there were so <laughs> many bad ideas that I'm not going to take equity for these terrible ideas. So there's a lot of venture suits today that take the opposite approach. They go, we don't know which one's going to like take off, but we'll just take a, a little slice of a bunch of these. Yeah. And actually that's, if you look at it mathematically, that's actually not a terrible idea. Um, but uh, the, the funny thing about that is like, uh, keep in mind, like the kind of companies that I was like, a venture studio is more like, we're going to build an idea and then take a slice or whatever. I think um, the companies that are coming to me, they were already YC companies. Usually they were already funded YC, post funded YC companies. And so they were wise to how, how, you know, expensive equity was. So they weren't just going to dish it out to somebody for building their iPhone app. That just wasn't going to happen. On the left coast R and D website, you talk about apps that you had helped or participated in have been downloaded over a million times and regularly featured in the top hundred categories. Which app was the most successful in terms of downloads or high feature ranking? Oh, I don't know. I don't look at that page very much. <laughs> You don't remember your biggest hit, the thing that you maybe helped with, write the MVP for? No. The biggest one. It's up here. 
Probably the biggest ones that we did are listed here is um, the one on the top left, Hike. So Hike is a large social network. We didn't build it. We just helped work on it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it has more than 100 million users in India, but nobody ever hears of it outside of India. Interesting. Uh, is it, so it's like Facebook of India? It's, like, it's more like WhatsApp of India. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you, and that was a YC company? No, no, no. How'd you meet them? <sighs> Oh, how did I meet them? I think one of their execs used to work at Motorola when he got acquired by Google. And then one of the guys I know worked there and I got brought in to do some high level stuff for them. And he then moved to hike and he was like, he called me. He's like, dude, we're losing, we're corrupting half a million accounts a week. We're, with this bug, we can't figure out, can you help it out? Mm. <laughs> so I was like, sure. Interesting problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. You also, uh, this is a quote from Biz Stone, co-founder of Twitter. He says, working with Aynar was not only productive, it was a joy. Uh, what did you work on with Biz? Uh, Jelly. What was Jelly? Social Q&A network he launched, uh, I guess, four or five years ago now. It okay. was a very interesting concept, actually. It was this notion that you have a network and in your network of people and th who they know, um, you, there probably is an answer to most things, even things that are quite hard to Google. So there's a set of questions that are hard to Google, or at least, you know, you want to get it from a trusted ish source. Mm -hmm. and so there was from, from, you know, the, the concept, at least when I was working on it was, um, how do you get, like, how do you, how do you root, uh, questions in trusted networks and like reward that, that rooting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So you worked with him a little bit there. That mm -hmm. app is he, he, that's, he's not still working on jelly. No, he's back at Twitter, I think back at Twitter. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So that was your touch point there. So uh, one piece, cause I think this is going to be, you know, tying nicely to discretion and tiny capital later on in our conversation. Um, as the world flattens, see, not tiny capital. That's sorry. You guys, you guys, by the way, that's a brand you guys have got to figure that out from a branding perspective. It's, it's too similar. It's too similar. Okay, but let me let me go back to this question. Um, you list a partner named Sergey, uh, who who represented a lot of your European operations. It sounds like I'm, I'm I don't know that for a fact, but for your this kind of consulting, this R and D consulting for apps like yeah. Jelly, you know, fast forward today. Uh, you know, you talk with Dan Martel in his interview about uh, Andy and you know. Longmont and uh, Trilogy and essentially how Constellation now will buy up these companies, rip out the tech team, and then basically give those jobs to overseas locations, whether it's Argentina, Krakow, somewhere else. Uh, they've actually built a massive business doing this. It's the site called crossover.com. It's the recruiting arm. And that's how sure. they quickly rip out a tech team and replace them. Was Sergey your partner? I mean, when you tried to build stuff cheaper and more effectively? Did Sergey spin up teams throughout Eastern European kind of countries where the labor was already really cost effective? Yeah, so Sergey, Sergey's a great guy. I, he's been working uh, with me. And I met him right after, uh, you know, I, I left uh, Remail. And he's, he's an amazing dude. He has, um, basically he has a team in Rush, Russia and Ukraine. So that's where most of the, the, the dudes, um, the developers are. Um, and yeah, he has the capability of going from like mm, two developers on a project to 20 developers on a project, like within a week or two. So like a founder listening right now going, okay, I had office in San Francisco, but like we're shutting that down because of the virus. We're, we're going to cancel our lease. We're going to move fully remote. Now I can hire anybody in the world. Uh, and they're going to go in and hire their first person. And, you know, they found them in a dev shop in Krakow, Poland. What words of wisdom would you give them to make sure they do it effectively? Oh, it's hard. That's my main thing. I don't know. I don't know how to do it well. Like this is probably why I've stuck with Sergey for so long because I trust him and he <laughs> trusts me. And like I know that he he's a good engineering manager. He can hire and fire, and he can get shit done. Like the hardest part of, of, of doing remote is like a <clears throat> figuring out if they're any good, and then making sure they stay good. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the time, like you hire someone, they're amazing for a month, and then all of a sudden, like you clearly cannot be working on this full time anymore. Like you must be taking other projects because things are ground to a halt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had situations where, <clears throat> where like people do, I hire people and all of a sudden, like halfway through a project, um, they stop responding to emails. And I'm like, I mean, are you dead? Like, did, did you get run over? What happened? 
Um, they're going to hold him. I, I'm sh- I think there's one guy in particular. I think I own I owe like two or three thousand dollars to him because he you know he never even he stopped completely stopped responding to my emails. Never did any more check ins and didn't even send me an invoice for the for the work that he had done. And <laughs> still to this day, no. I, I, mean, I don't know. Huh. Okay, well, this maybe is a precursor to what you started in 2014, which was App Aftercare, which is essentially, right. you know, if you work on a tool and these developers pass it off to you, then stop responding to all your emails. You've got to be able to maintain it and grow it internally with your team. Was, right. was that sort of frustration the, the seed behind App Aftercare? Yes. So, so the thinking there was really that in the 2014 time, I, a bunch of companies had done this. They already built an app, usually with an outsourced team, and then, or a lot of them had. And then um, they'd get to a point where they're like, okay, it's done now. Like the, the agency who never did it, handed over the app and the code and said, sayonara. And, and in some cases, those uh, relationships weren't that great by the time the app got delivered. Um, you know, the, there might have been some miscommunication or budget overruns or whatever. So what we basically said was like, okay, your options at this point is to hire your own iOS and or Android developers in-house. But that's quite expensive just in order to maintain an app that's effectively already done. So we said, all right, for a fixed monthly fee, we'll handle that for you. Like we'll do, we'll instrument the app, we'll fix it if it crashes, we'll make sure it's this much uptime, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, yeah, we were basically like like a service that said, all right, you have an app, we'll maintain it for you so you don't have to hire someone in-house to do that. And we will add sort of minor tweaks and things to you. Isn't that, I mean, if you take over a code base that they hired some other outsourced dev team to run, I mean, yeah. isn't it almost sometimes better to just rewrite it from scratch versus trying to understand the architecture with no comments, right? That, mm-hmm. that you know, these outsourced te- this outsourced team put together? Sometimes, but I keep in mind that what we do is not, like we were not doing massive feature development. Like we weren't doing that. We were doing like, okay, it's crashing. Let's make sure it stops crashing for you. Like, Got it. oh, you need to add this menu item. You need, like, this was definitely, like, there, there was some that tried to essentially make us their outsourced development shop for, you know, the monthly fee we charged, which was not tenable. But a large part of how to make that kind of a business successful is to make sure that you're pre-qualifying, is make sure that you're pre-qualifying um, uh, your, your, your customers before you sign them up. Mm-hmm. So 26, 26- give me a second here. Yeah, take your time. Hey, buddy. I'm on an interview, and you can't be shouting out by now. Thank you. Sorry, that was my boy shouting with the dog right how, outside. The how, how, how many kiddos do you have, Anar? I have eight year old twins, boy and a girl. Oh, holy mackerel. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. been an interesting homeschooling experience, put it that way. Oh, well, we'll have to circle back to that in a bit. Let's pick up here back though at App After Course. So 2016, you had bootstrapped the company, I believe. And what, you, you got tired of it and just got rid of it, sold it? I sold it, yeah, 2016. Was that because you just got tired of it and wanted to move on or you just got an offer that was so big you had to take it? No, I got sick of it and then I got a decent enough offer and I was happy with it. And it, it gave me enough time. It gave me enough cash to like, you know, down payment on a house and uh, not have to work for a few years. And uh, I, I, I realized that, that kind of a business had a ceiling that was lower than I was interested in running yep. for a long time. So that would have been then your first, because Remail, there wasn't a lot of cash involved. That was really your first thing that you built, that you sold, where there was cash at the end, right? This is, you know, you're probably taking a lot of those lessons down to discretion capital, which we'll get to in a second. But did you learn anything from that app after core exit where you're like, oh, I'll, I'll never do it this way again, or I really like this, I'm gonna do that again if I sell a company? No, there wasn't much of that. Um, Really, the sort of discretion thing, like the sort of learnings I came from discretion sort of came from interacting with private equity and holding companies after I'd already exited and bummed around and bought this place and helped my wife with this farming business and all this stuff. So what happened was I ended up doing, uh, so a friend of mine worked at a, a consulting firm in, in Chicago and he called me and he's like, hey dude, what are you doing? And I was like, nothing. And he goes, can you go to Florida next week? And I was like, why would I go to Florida next week? He says, I'll fly your business class and I'll pay you, I think it's fifteen or $20,000 for three days worth of work. I was like, e- okay, I'll do that. That's fine. Um, and then basically what I was doing was diligence, due diligence, technical and marketing due diligence work for private equity buying e-com- mostly e-commerce businesses. And so the business, that side of, sort of the, what led to discretion essentially grew out of that. So you, you, uh, I started to realize and I was talking to these 
um, uh, these PE guys. And we do things like, you know, hang on the bar after we've done the management meetings. And they were saying like, hey, man, like if you, you know, if you, we pay for deal flow. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean you pay for deal flow? What does that mean? And he says, well, you know, if you introduce us to a company and we buy it, we'll give you a percentage of the purchase price. And I was like, holy shit. Yes. Okay. I can do that. Like an email for, 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 in order for a big payday, that's fine. Um, so I did a couple of buy side deals uh, with some of the private equity funds, mostly on the e-commerce side. And then um, as I was doing that, by, by this time, like sort of the YC network um, had grown enormously because there's, so, there's now so many more companies in that network. And also like the, the uh, so my other big network is in and around microconf. And um, I, people just started, you know, reaching out and saying, hey, you know, I know you sort of straddle this private equity venture world. Uh, we have an offer. Is this a good offer? What do you think? And I would just give them my advice. Like, I think, no, I'm either like, no, this is a terrible offer or this is, this seems a reasonable offer, you know, or I don't know. Like, it, it really depends. Um, and so that's how that, that whole thing started. And people then started reaching out and saying, hey, like, we don't have an offer, but we're considering selling. Can you help us run that process? And I was like, all right, sure. <laughs> so started doing that. And really when, um, and, and fundamentally what I realized pretty quickly is that things have changed very much the last 10 years, like certainly even potentially the last five years, in that, so back in 2009, you know, 2010, if you had a, say, a 1 million, 2 million ARR B2B SaaS company, um, you know, at, say, break even, it wasn't obvious that you could sell that for, for any reasonable amount of money, certainly. Um, but... I think in part what's happened is that the big sort of the software PE players have moved down market in part because they realize like, A, it's obviously cheaper to buy smaller businesses, but also um, I think the, the debt providers on the back end to do the purchases have started to understand software businesses to a point where the economics make sense for the private equity guys. And so what that means is that sort of if you get a, a B2B SaaS business north of a million or two million or something like that, it's worth something, like even if, at least if you break even or better, um, you know, and so, so you can actually have an exit and a meaningful one, both for like founders and potentially for investors, even without, you know, IPOing or being acquired for a hundred million dollars by, um, by Microsoft or whatever. And I think, I, I think that's one of the fundamental differences between sort of particularly B2B SaaS, but also generally software businesses and other kinds of startups. Like if you have, say, uh, juice delivery service that's doing two million a year, mm-hmm. and like, are you going to be able to sell that? You know, at, like for any reasonable amount of money. You know, if you're break even, probably not. No, mm-hmm. like it's you. You may make some money. Like the founders may do okay, but it's not the same. Like you couldn't sell that for three, four, five, six times revenue, depending on how you grow. Yep. Now, g- getting back to kind of a foray that, you know, people listening right m- might, might know of. So did you represent uh, Rob Walling and Drip with the lead pages acquisition? Uh, no. Okay, you did not. What was your first, was Convergio really your first kind of e-commerce sale at discretion? Convergio is not an e-commerce sale. It's a, it's a SaaS for e-commerce, the players. Got it, to campaign moniker, but, but it's CM Commerce today. Yes, it is. Yes. I guess my question, though, because I, I want to dive on one of these deals and learn more, right? So, was Conversio the kind of the gonna, first? I'm not going to not, not going to discuss any of the deals. No numbers, no nothing. We don't have to discuss numbers, but you're doing SaaS M&A at discretion, correct? I'd like to understand more from you on how these patterns work out. So, sure. you have Conversio on your website, correct? Yeah, yeah. We can okay, so it's not like we have to be crazy. Private. You you have it as a big logo on sure. the website. So Conversio, when you first engage with a founder and they cold email you for advice, you have to at some point move from the advice perspective to let's actually make this something that I can spend more of my time on. Here's how I'm going to get paid. The early yeah. days when you were in the bars with the PE firms, it was a percent of the sale. Is that your model today? Yes. We're mostly a success fee. Sometimes, sometimes it's a percentage of the whole thing. And sometimes, um, quite often what happens is they have some sort of an offer, say $5 million, and they come to me and say, do you think this is a good offer or can you give me something better? And I say, I don't think this is a good offer. And yes, I do. And then there's a, it's a percentage of the value add on top of the of whatever base price we agree. Okay. And if they tell you an unrealistic base price that you think you can't beat, you just say you have unrealistic expectations and you don't take them on as a customer? 
Correct. Or I just tell them if they already have an offer, I'm saying like, you don't need my services really, unless you really want help negotiating and things. Mm -hmm. Um, And you should probably just take this offer. Like I had someone come through from YC and they were like, "Uh, I just need to know if this is a good offer. Like maybe we can, you can help us negotiate. (laughs) And I think they were doing, I think they were doing about a million ARR and they got an offer for 30. When I was like, yeah, 30 times revenue. That's, that's a good offer. I don't think I'm going to be able to beat that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there's obviously strategy uh, involved there. They've got to have a rock star team or something uh, that makes a 30x multiple work. Yeah, I, I, I never dove, you know, deep enough to really understand their business to understand why. But, but so here's the thing. So it's so, so, there's, so effectively in my world, there's three kinds of buyers for these kinds of businesses. There's, there's value-based private equity uh, or financial sponsors, but let's just call them private equity. There's growth-based private equity and then there's strategic buyers. And so they buy different things and for different reasons. And so uh, sort of value-based PE guys typically don't pay for growth. Like they will, they will obviously, like they'll take it, like, but they're not going to be paying five, six, seven, eight times revenue, even if you're growing north of 100%, 100% a year. The growth guys, on the other hand, will pay for that. So they'll be the ones who are the higher multiple in terms of, say, revenue uh, on the sort of financial sponsor private equity side. And then, you know, typically they cap, it, it depends, but they can cap out at, my, my rule of thumb is like seven or eight times revenue, like more than that is sometimes, but, um, and again, it depends on the size of the company uh, and sort of how profitable they are, obviously. But, but that's sort of the upper limit. In some cases you get 10 to 11, something like that. But above that, it's almost always strategic. Now, <clears throat> the difference so, so the question then becomes like, why does the strategic pay 30x when the ceiling for uh, like a financial sponsor is like say 10? And, and uh, that's- Sorry, when you say five, let me just go back real quick. So you said PE growth, seven to eight X multiple str- strategic buyers, you can get up to 10 X plus, but there that first category, the PE- the- No, no, no. So it goes like, no, no, no. It's like usually my, my rule of thumb for the size companies I do is like, depending on growth. So, it's, it, you know, it's like, if you're doing- um, so obviously doing north of a million ARR, ideally north of 2 million ARR, if you're growing zero to 20%, then like what is an easy multiple to get, I think is about 3X. And then uh, and, and from, from 20 up to about 50%, you can probably get 4X, maybe five. From 50 to about 100% growth, this is annual growth, um, you can get anywhere from five to, five to seven times. And so the value buyers are the ones looking to pay, usually they're, they're hoping to pay 1X, but those days are over. <laughs> I think they're usually looking to pay two to four times revenue. And then above that, you really go get into the growth club. The people are willing to pay anywhere from four to seven times, seven, eight, maybe nine, sometimes 10, depending on the size of the company and the profitability. And then above that, it's all strategics, um, usually. And so those guys, like I said, they can pay 30X. Now, why would they pay 30X if the, if the ceiling is 10 from other types of players? And it's either because there are multiple strategics at the table or um, it's because of it outside of it's outside of process. So if you really want to get 30 X revenue or 20 X revenue or 15 times revenue, um, it's hard to do that. If you're in like a sales process with a broker, like if a broker is going out to market, then the strategic knows that, okay, there's a floor on pricing because here's what the, the private equity companies and guys are willing to pay. So I'll just go in slightly above that. So then they might come in at nine, 10, 11, maybe seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Um, but, if you're not in the process and they really want to, then they're not really fighting the other buyers at the table. They're fighting you not wanting to sell because you have these big visions and you're like, well, I don't want to sell unless I get a ludicrous price and you name the ludicrous price. And in some cases they say yes. So three categories, value-based private equity, growth-based private equity, then strategic buyers. Let's just flash forward today. It's 2020, early 2020. Right now, n- name, a, name a, a value-based private equity firm. I got to be a little careful there because the, some of the value guys don't like to be called value buyers. Um, well, well, I guess put a face to the theory is what I'm asking. Yeah. So like a, a typical value base, one of the guys you're talking about, like ESW, um, you know, some of those guys, they're looking, they, they'll pay things that are sort of falling knives. They'll do, usually they're doing the rip and replace stuff. Yeah. Those guys are, I would say value type buyers. They're usually like they're up the, the highest bid I've ever seen from any of them is like, at least for, for those type of operations is like three, three and a half times revenue. And then they feel in, then they're feeling like they're paying top dollar. 
Yep. You're, you're familiar with scales work and scale works in San Antonio because you've mentioned in a prior interview, you'd probably put this, them in this category, correct? Um, it, I think for them, it depends a little. So, okay. So you have to understand like a private equity company that's mostly a value buyer, um, can pay higher multiples for tuckets. So they might come in and they say, okay, we bought a $15 million ARR company and we paid 2.75 X revenue. We're feeling great about it. Now, here comes a company that, you know, ANR is selling and it's doing 1 million. And it, maybe it's growing at 50, 60%, but it's an amazing fit. Strategic, and it sort of becomes semi-strategics. And at that point, those guys will pay more. Mm -hmm. um, but typically not for a platform. No, I don't think. Interesting. Um, what about the second category, growth private equity? Can you, can you put a face to the name? Sure. So, uh, you know, Marlin Equity, uh, Inside Partners certainly are. Um, Axel KKR will pay for growth. Um, yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of them. Yeah, um, and then you know, and sometimes sometimes they have like hybrid, like they have a venture arm and then a buyout arm, and they have like they have a minority or growth equity piece to them as well. Mm -hmm. Strategic buyers are fairly obvious. Founders know who their strategic buyers are, right? These are the it's Benioff at Salesforce or Bezos at Amazon, sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah, or like shit you've never heard of because it's really old school on-prem software who are like realizing that shit, they're losing all their customers to this, this, this company that's run by three dudes in Utah and they need to buy them immediately. Yep. So before we move on to, to Tiny, uh, give me a sense. Discretion launched in 2018. I've been working on it for call it two, three years. How many total deals have you represented? And, and can you give me some sense on GMV total? Uh, I'm not going to give you GMV total. We've done, let's say dozens. Okay. Dozens. Well, uh, I guess now that you're also working on tiny, t like in 2020, how many deals do you think you'll do at discretion? Well, fucking COVID, but uh, probably f somewhere between four and six. Okay. Fair enough. Let's go into tiny now. Uh, and again, my, my research was wrong here. I thought you met Rob V when he sold drip, but that's, that was not accurate. When did you meet Rob Walling? Oh, years ago. Um, actually I was at the first or the second microconf. Like, so after, uh, after remail and the whole thing, I was a little burnt out by Silicon Valley, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, people try to get me to sort of say, you know, I had a really good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine. He was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, why don't you just start a mobile social network app and I'll get one of my friends to buy it? <laughs> I was like, ah, this is not how, like, this is not how Silicon works. Valley works. Yeah, yeah. I was like, ah, yeah, I know, I know that's how it worked. And it probably actually would have worked out pretty well. Um, but I just wasn't interested. And so Rob was really one of the first people who did this, um, uh, who, who had this notion that there was sort of a, a different way to do startups that wasn't just like, let's raise a shit ton of money. Let's, let's, they're sort of levered for growth, right? It's like, let's raise as much money as we can, as quickly as we can, and in order to grow as much as we can, and like, let's not, let's forget about, you know, profits or sustainability or really anything. It's just the, the only thing that, that matters is growth. Um, and like, you basically have to be fundraising every 18 months in order to, to make that model work. And he was one of the first people who was like, you don't have to do that. Like, you could, and it's sort of, a, actually, to me at least, sort of a similar feeling to like PG's old essays in the sense that it's like, oh, it's open your eyes. So like you can have, you know, a sustainable, calm software business that's throwing off cash. Uh, like that's something that you can build without necessarily having to go ask permission from Silicon Valley VCs in order to do it. Because that fundamentally, like that's what you need to do. Like if you're going to raise money and do a traditional Silicon Valley VC type thing, you need the permission of the people with the money to do it. So what does Tiny? So what does Tiny do today? Tiny Seed basically provides capital <laughs> for companies that are, are are like that. And so what we saw was so so the the way to think about it, if you know YC, is like YC effectively filled a pretty big hole in like a five or six, along with a couple of other players like First Round Capital. And so what they did was they said, you know what? I, and and people don't remember this, but like YC gave very little amounts of money initially. They gave like I think Airbnb got. I'm, I'm going to guess $30,000, something like that. And so they give you just a little bit of money because you don't need uh, half a million or a million dollars in order to do something like this. And Airbnb showed you didn't. And you could just go out, do something, 
focus for three months, build, launch, and, and go from there. And they were obviously hugely successful with that model. Now, what we saw was that there's a lot of companies in and around MicroConf and in those type of environments where what happens is someone is a consultant and they go along and they either see a problem that they have or a client has, and they decide I should, you know, either they've been asked to do something repeatedly, like, you know, fix this problem again and again, or they, they sort of uh, scratch their own itch in that regard. And they don't build, launch, and get a couple of paying customers, um, you know, in the, uh, into their customer. But the problem is they're not making enough money so that they can quit their day job or quit consulting full time, you know. So, I mean, the sort of poster boy for this is, is, is Nathan Barry. Do you know Nathan at ConvertKit? Yeah, no, no Nathan well. Um, and, and by the way, I would argue whether you're just a cash flow lifestyle business uh, that's growing rapidly and you're doing 10, 20, 30 million in AR like, you know, Nathan, or you're like Ryan Holmes at Hootsuite, right? Who they start off as an agency. Now Hootsuite yeah. went the venture path, right? But like one of the dif differentiations I want to make over the next 10 minutes is a founder doesn't know when they have success in an agency and they start to spin up software, if it's going to be something that they can go hit a massive home run with, or if it's going to be a Nathan Barry, 10, 20, 30 million, get really wealthy off your own cash flow sort of model. And right. so how do they know whether to go the VC route or the tiny route at such an early stage? <coughs> well, the difference is this, there's hardly any way you can get money <laughs> if you tried. Like, so Hootsuite is slightly different, I guess, but they already had a big vision. If your vision is like... No, but they didn't. Ryan, if you listen to how we talked about, it was right. literally, I'm spinning tech out of an agency. He right. had a little agency. He, is that how he raised money? No. In I mean, the first, no the capital. first deck, the first deck, if you look at it, it did not, it did not have, you know, 180, 200, 300 million bucks in ARR, right? As a projected oh. size in the market. But, but my point is this, like, and maybe this has changed, but, but right now, if you wanted to come and you want to raise money, I mean, not right. Let's, let's, let's say six months ago before things got crazy. Six months ago, you can't go, or you, you can, but you're not going to be successful. You can come and say, my goal is to build a software business that will do like Nathan's, like 20 million ARR, um, you know, you know, throwing off cash, presumably, uh, doing reasonably well. Like that's my goal, like 20, 30, 40, 50 million ARR. No seed investor, will, traditional seed investor will give you any money because their model doesn't work with that. Anar, uh, I've never met a founder, even Nathan Barry, I bet you couldn't find any interviews of him in early days of ConvertKit saying this. Uh, my plan is to build, uh, or sorry, uh, I, I would not be okay if my company took off and ended up doing 40, 80, 100, 200 million bucks in revenue. In other words, what happens is you have a sense that the space, space might be small, not venture backable. So you say, I'm totally cool building a 10, $20 million lifestyle business. Nothing wrong with that. My flip side to that is, if you're trying to get your hands on money where there's very little downside, Founders will just lie to themselves and make up a story that says they're going to be a big business to get the VC dollars. And that happens all the time. So, so, so that founder... So what happens then in that case, right, is that they take um, a, a structure like a safe, in particular like an uncapped safe, and then what they do is usually is they have a pitch deck that they believe in, and then they look at it and go, yeah, no investor is going to give me money there. So I'm going to put a couple of slides at the end that has like a hockey stick. That's right. Like a, this is how we take over the world. That's right. And so what happens if they're successful is in, in the extreme case of say the investor just writes an uncapped safe, they are successful to the point where like they're making say $20 million a year and then, you know, come to us and decide we want to sell it. And we are able to sell them for say 5X revenue. So now they have a hundred million dollar exit, but it, they never needed any more money than the original safe. Now, where does the investor end up on that side of things? They, they get their money back. So if they put $250,000 in, when the company sells for $100 million, they get $250,000 back. So they have negative IRR effectively. Now, <clears throat> what will that investor do? Like, do, they, do you think they'll be like, oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to keep doing exactly what I did because my, I'm having such great success. No. What happens is they either decide, well, I'm not, definitely not putting money into this. I'm going to put money into real estate instead. Or they decide... Like, oh, this is why they say you should only go after companies that are, that are potentially much bigger. So then that most or all of that capital effectively flows to a smaller and smaller set of companies. And these companies are the ones that from the outset go out and claim they want to take over the world. They want to become multi-billion IPO type companies. And so because there's then more and more capital chasing those kind of companies, the valuation for those companies goes up. And then when the valuation goes up, 
um, the outcome that they have to have in order for it to make sense becomes much bigger, which again means that the, the group of companies that fit the profile become smaller. And it's sort of this vicious cycle of like more and more capital being concentrated in a smaller, smaller set of, of companies. And effectively, what we're arguing is like, that doesn't make any sense. Given the, 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 the nature of the environment, there are a much larger number of investable companies out there um, than just the ones that set out to be, you know, unicorns or decacorns from day one. I mean, a, a good example of this is like, uh, is, is Sam Altman. And I, I know Sam, he's, he's a good guy. I've actually jumped out of a plane with Sam Altman. But um, he, he wrote a piece in, I think in January saying, how to, how to invest in a startup. And he said, you should never invest in any company um, that couldn't potentially be a $10 billion company. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like there's a lot of companies and a lot of value creation out there, but you have to find the balance correctly such that founders do well, but also investors do well enough that they'll want to keep investing in those kinds of companies. And that's effectively the balance that we're trying to do with Tennessee. Well, let's like peel back one layer, you know, one layer behind you and Rob and one layer behind Sam and PG and talk about the money behind the money, right? Which is when you go out, the reason Sam would say that in an article is because when he's raising from LPs, he's pitching an IRR that best in class has got to be 40, 50%, right? The best in class VC firms are in the 40, 50% IRR range. I assume that's probably not the IRR you're pitching your LPs. Yeah, we're pitching 20, 30%, something like that. Yeah, our current portfolio is about 55% last time I checked. And when somebody asks you, and a potential LP asks you, hey, uh, Anar, with this model where you're not investing in potential like big outcome opportunities, how do you foresee yourself getting to a 35 or 40% IRR without the one you know, but, company making up the other? But, 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 here's the how, thing. Do you re- how do you respond? Because that's simply not the case. So we invest early. And actually, if you look at the distributions specifically on, on outcomes for B2B SaaS companies, very early stage B2B SaaS companies, they are power law distributed as, as in the similar way that traditional sort of venture backed companies are power law distributed. So in that kind of an environment, you actually would expect there to be outliers similarly to uh, how you expect there to be outliers in, in say, in, in Sam's model. Now, the difference is, like Sam is slightly different because he gets an amazing price at, 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 the, at the companies that he does. But say your, your standard venture investor, they end up having to pay uh, 12 million pre or 15 million pre to get in. Now, at that kind of company, then a, a, a 50x return is, needs to be $500 million, right? But for us, because we are investing in earlier stage and companies that at least at the outset don't necessarily, they want to effectively preserve the optionality of exiting at 20 million or 50 million. If you're coming in at one and a half million pre, then a 50x return is, is the company sells for 75. Now, those kind of outcomes are much more doable and much more frequent than, uh, you know, you, I, something selling for 750 million or a billion dollars. You just mentioned a 55% IR so far at Tiny, but I, I, you tell me if this is correct or not. I would argue mo- because of how you're structured, most of your returns have come from dividends paid out, not company exits. Is that true? Uh, so we, we started, we have zero dividends yet. We invest so early that there's, you know, none of the companies are in a point where they decided that they want to take, start taking cash out. So like IRR is, is, and this is true for venture too, like traditional venture too, IRR is a measure mostly of markups. <laughs> Like it's, it's usually like, okay, you, I invested at a million pre, they haven't made any money. They haven't even potentially got any customers, but now Andreessen Harvest invested at uh, 20 million pre, well, I'm going to mark them up 20 X. Okay. Got that's it. So you, you get, that's how you get a 40, 50% IRR. So I mean, you, IRR you've doesn't had, really matter. You can't, you've, you can't eat IRR. You got to you eat DPI. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to DPI here in a second. But you, so when you talk about IR at tiny, again, because your model is very different than a VC, right? You're writing $120,000 for 10 to 12% equity plus another $60,000 per additional founder when they enter your cohort. I believe yeah. that's correct. You're yeah. saying your market, your, your IR so far is because uh, other VCs have come in after you and, and marked up the companies and, and put a new valuation on the company. So we've had, we had 22, 23 investments. Three companies have raised money and yeah, those have all been markups. And then, uh, at least one company, we have evaluation metrics along with what I described. At least one company is at the point where I could take them with discretion and sell them for a price that we're now marking them up. Got it. Okay, got it. So three have raised, so it's paper returns and one is potential exit. That will be a great return at one point that you're kind of considering in that 55% IR you just told me. So there has not been any DP. There's no big cash paid out to LPs yet. 
No, no, no. Because we started, in, I mean, like, this is a 10-year fund. Our first year is a 10-year fund, and we made, wrote our first checks uh, 12 months ago. Got it. Makes sense. So, so walk me through the founder that joins you, who is arguably anti-VC, right? Mm-hmm. Because yes. by nature, your thesis is not that. But the markups you just articulated are based off three that have raised at higher valuations. What personality changes the founder go through where they go from a tiny seed mindset to, okay, now I'm on the venture track? Usually what happens is this is sort of what we talk. It's like for the people, so, so keep in mind. So just because three people have raised does not mean all of them are now on the venture track. Like there's one company, I think, who he realized that as he was going through it, that he, the, the opportunity ahead of him was bigger than he thought. And so he was willing to go and raise money on the venture track and sort of take those trade-offs. I mean, because the trade-off is as follows. And, and I'm sure you understand this, but just so everyone's clear. The trade-off is as follows. Like if you take a high valuation, 10, 12, 15 million dollars, and you raise a bunch of money, that's, that closes off your opportunity to exit for 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. You simply won't be able to. Like there'll be, usually there are restrictions in place that mean that your investors that came in at those valuations will be able to block any sale that you have. So if you go onto a venture track like that, you're effectively saying like, I'm fine with the fact that I can't sell for less than some high number. And so for us, that's fine. Like we, we have been very careful about uh, sort of structuring our investments in such a way that if that's what you want to do, that's great. Like we'll just, we'll come along for the ride and your adventure, this traditional venture route now, that's fine. We, I, the thing is, I have nothing against a traditional venture. I'm just saying that effectively what we're arguing is there is something in addition to that like you don't have to be either gung ho for an IPO or n- not at all, you know, no kind of fundraising whatsoever. Like you shouldn't even start the company. That's yep. effectively why we're arguing. Yep. Of those three that I've raised, I'm curious, you guys have a specific clause uh, in your contract they have on the website. And I'm curious if VCs that came in on those three that have raised, if there's any pushback to this clause, the clause is this, if you decide to raise additional venture capital, our equity converts to the same class of stock as your new investors. And we retain a right to participate in your future financing around at whatever valuation that happens at the last part of that. Fine. The first part where the class of stock converts, I mean, most new investors, B, C, D, there's a new preferred class of stock that's issued for obvious reasons. Have you guys had any of that dynamic set up? And if so, does the new VC try and get you to get rid of that right? We haven't yet, mostly because they've then moved on to usually raising using a convertible note or a safe. So our rate right doesn't actually kick in until they have a price ground. Um, but <clears throat> no, I, I, I would expect that the companies that do well, that go on to do multiple rounds of financing, yeah, we would have to give up our um, our dividend right and and some of that stuff, um, but we certainly intend to um, to to protect our pro rata rights um, in subsequent fund, funding rounds. And actually, a bunch of our LPs are coming in because they think you know there'll be some follow on opportunity that they won't be part of, and and we effectively facilitate that for the investors. That's, side that's sidecar we're... deals there, or you'll do it from the fund. Sidecar usually we're doing SPVs. We haven't yeah. really focused on two, but. I think that's what we'll still do. I think we'll effectively what we're looking to do is um, make our money doing our primary business. Like we we don't like we're sort of similar to YC in that that we're we're looking to effectively index broadly into the market. And I don't think and you you saw now with YC changing their policy on follow on investment stuff. Like there's definitely some PR flack, and I don't even necessarily know that the the returns are as great for YC uh, in that kind of an investment compared to their main fund. So, so realistically, and there's obviously some signaling risk too. It's like, oh, YC, they follow on a bunch of stuff, except you, why not? <laughs> and so we worry, like we worry about that. And I think we're, we're likely to stick with this structure. That's like, okay, we're going to focus on what we're good at, which is picking these very early stage companies, guiding them to like profitability or to a point where if they wanted to go and get raised VC, they can do that. Um, but then say, okay, We'll have a provider right, but effectively our LP base, we, we extend that right to the LP base and they come in as they want. Yeah. If we do this same interview 20 years from now and I have you and Rob on and I go, guys, what, what, what happened? Did you get more of your returns from actual exits or from founders going, I love my lifestyle business. I'm going to get rich off dividends. And oh, by the way, Tiny gets a part of all those dividends. Do you guys make more money over the long term from dividends or from exits? Exits, obviously. Interesting. I, I mean, wouldn't expect that answer. I mean, the math is pretty straightforward. The math is like, okay, what's the net margin on a B2B SaaS business north of 2 million? 30%, 40, maybe 50% sometimes. That's great. Say it's 30%. That's probably about average. <clears throat> so if you have 30% versus, so then uh, say you're selling at 5X, 5X revenue. 
right? That's at least 15 years of dividends to make up for that, right? So 30%, 30%, 30% roughly makes it, you know, 1x revenue. And then you have to do that five times over. And that's how you get a 5x return, the same return from dividends. Yeah. There's no doubt. But I mean, like, it does, it does add to the return. So the modeling that we're doing effectively shows that it adds about... Oh, doing math in my head. I would say it probably adds 20% ish to return. Yeah. But then I mean, again, I, like it's such a new model. We don't know whether the fast, obviously, the, like, like I said, we, we will have outliers. The environment that we invest in have outliers and they dis, outliers as in traditional venture disproportionately affects returns. That's right. Sure. But you, the, the trick question, is though, your thesis at the beginning though is not to invest in potential outliers. That's the whole trick. No, no, no. We're not, no, no, no. We're not investing in companies that at the outset want to be outliers. That's different. We're not saying we will, if we invest in you and you become an outlier, we're like, oh shit, we fucked up. So you're looking at accidental outliers. Do you want accidental outliers or intentional ones that are going to be an outlier? The accidental ones. Why? Because, 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 because of the nature of um, early stage investment in the sort of power law nature of outcomes that we're seeing, that you can see, and this is true for five, like 500 startups is actually one of the few people who, who very early on articulated this and says, and like, there's a bunch of research that effectively shows you should be investing much more broadly than you are. And I think, I personally think that's why most angel investors do really poorly at the early stage of, of uh, tech investing. It's because they don't have enough uh, portfolio, companies in their portfolio. It's basically an admission that it, you're actually bad at picking winners, but you know you're bad at it. So spread your net and, and your hopes of getting lucky in the future. You're setting yourself up to get lucky. Effectively, yeah. I mean, yeah. what we want to be effectively is... A, is, is almost like an index fund into the very early stages of B2B SaaS company. So you guys have done four, put 48 through your cohorts so far? 23. Uh, but you've had two cohorts. Oh, you, both cohorts together. 10, is 23. And then 13, yeah. Okay, so how do you get that up to, I mean, to your point just now, don't you have to get up to like 100, 200, 300, 500 startups? No, uh, it depends on the expected return on the, based on some of the modeling is like, it, it, it again, it depends, but like, I think you probably need to have at least 50 companies in your core to be, to, to have the outcome where uh, you're expected to have it like at least like a 5x return on capital. All right. And our, before we wrap up back in September, before the world changed, September, 2019, you articulated you're about to set out and start raising fund two for yes. tiny. Then, yes. then the world shuts down. <laughs> how's, <laughs> how's fund two going? Fun too. We're just about to start fundraising. Uh, it, it, we were going to start going to market, honestly, in, uh, I guess in February, that was the plan. Um, but then obviously COVID hits and it, it seemed a little mm, inappropriate to start calling family offices and ask for cash when they were probably worried about whether, you know, what was going to happen to their grandparents and what, what they were going to do with their kids at home, <laughs> homeschooling them. So we put that on hold, but we're about to go to market now. Um, you know, we're doing, uh, we're being public about the fact that we're fundraising so we can sort of advertise it. So if you want to go to tinyc.com slash invest, you'll get, that's a, the fastest way to get a hold of me these days is to go in there and put your details in. What's Next, your, a lot of details about, you know, how things are going so far, you know, why we think the way we think is going to, is going to work out in terms of investments. How many kind of hard commits do you want to have before you do a first close? I haven't really thought about it. Like we're targeting 35 to 50 million, I think. Um, and so it's more of a date based first close or anything else. We're looking at a couple of different structures and, and like, we'll see what happens. Cause it, like I said, our goal is to invest in hundreds of companies a year. That's, that's yeah. the strategy eventually. Yeah. Um, and what, what was fund one size? Oh, it was only like four and a half, five million. Okay. Good, good, good. Good. Very interesting. Again, what's fascinating to me about this model is I love the fact that it's new. I love the fact that it's, see, I think what you're doing is actually very personality driven. The personality of founder that goes to a tiny is the one that hates tech crunch, you know, looks at the Uber, like fall and goes, ha ha. I knew this wasn't the way that you should always build a company because people end up getting screwed. I like building 20 million and having free cash flow. Like I just, I think you guys are a personality driven business more than anything else. And the personality that you surround yourself with, there are actually these bootstrap oriented high cash flow, which by the way is a great model, but it's very not go raise or, and by the way, it's also very not, I want to sell my company one day for a lot of money. No, I disagree with that. So I think I get that question a bunch for discretion actually. And it's like, <laughs> like particularly when I have like new, I can tell when a buyer is not really sophisticated when they first say to me, like I send them the, the, the one teaser or whatever, or they uh -huh. send, 
and they're like, why would anyone sell this? <laughs> like, why not sit on it forever? Like, uh, you know, I have a deal right now that's coming up and he's, he's, I think he's doing, oh, I thought last I checked, this is before COVID. He's doing 1.7 million and, and throwing up about a million in cash every year. And it, it's like zero work for him. And I was just like, because he wants to cash, like he wants to cash now and he wants to focus on other things. And I think, I think there's very few companies out there that you start and you grow and you just want to keep growing until you retire. I, I just, you know, well, it's I, not I just, that it's, it's, if you're generating so much wealth from free cash flow, like you don't have to grow more. You can just keep pumping off cash flow with no work. But again, again, keep in mind what we're talking about. Like, again, like one five, if your net margin is 30% and you can sell the company for five X revenue because of your current growth, then you have to wait 15 years to get the same money out in cash. And by the way, by the end of that time, you're probably, your growth is probably decayed to the point where you're no longer worth that 5x multiple. Now you're worth maybe 2x multiple. And make sure that you don't end up in a situation where you're like, you know, zero growth or God forbid, slightly less growth, because then you're not worth anywhere near as much anymore. Or you accidentally grow and you're the next Nathan Barry, where you would have sold at a million in ARR, but look at it now, it's, you know, 15, 20 million in ARR. That's no, sure. No, yeah, it's all I'm given not saying that it couldn't be. Uh, you know, like, but those are still valuable things. I actually think what will end up happening, and this is sort of a more of a out there thing, is I think people don't really fun- fundamentally understand the predictability and like the amazingness of these cash flow businesses once they get to a certain scale. And I think someone smart will end up like securitizing and packaging those type of cash flow. Yeah. Um, so why hasn't somebody done that yet? I don't know. Probably the same reason. I mean, I think it's in part people don't understand it well. I mean, it's the same reason why, you know, the, the debt providers for the private equity companies were, weren't able to provide any, cap, any, any buyout debt, you know, 10 years ago because they just didn't understand it. It wasn't the standard stuff. Like, it wasn't like, what's the EBITDA? You know, how much real estate is there? You know, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, I think it's just, Salesforce IPO, you know, Salesforce IPO was 2004. I mean, Slack just took a bond to market for $750 million at a 0.5% interest rate. I mean, this stuff is getting predictable and understandable. I, I mean, I like your idea. I'm curious why no one's done it yet. Why not securitize? Well, I think they, they, they do it. Like custom bespoke stuff like that tends to happen at the high sort of high valuation stuff first. And then it sort of trickles down. Someone looks at that and goes, well, fuck, if I can do it with Slack at, at who's this size, why can't I do it from a basket of companies each doing 10 million ARR? Why not? So, so what it's do you think that if you guys built that, what would that product look like you think five, 10 years from now? Oh, I have no idea. You're securitizing, you're, and you're enabling founders that are doing two to five million in ARR to get yeah. money at cheaper rates versus going to VC. And they're doing it by securitizing bonds, you know, issuing their own bonds, things like that. How would that work? Well, it's interesting. I think there's a company actually now that's sort of getting there. Um, it's just, oh, they hold. Pipe, maybe? I well, that's pipe. ARR. That's ARR factoring, though. There's a bunch of companies trying to do that. Yeah, but it's sort of similar. Like you can see that the the sort of lower stuff and the higher stuff sort of connecting together. Effectively, that's what you're doing, right? You're selling them. They're buying like a year's worth of your revenues, right? But from specific customers, you know what I mean? And then you you, you basically get that capital upfront. And they get a discount on the stuff. Like you can imagine a scenario where Pipe or someone like that does it, but instead of a single company and specific customers they sort of take a, a slice across a large number of, of companies. To de-risk. And, and, yeah, why not? And, and to scale more, because there are a lot more, uh, you know, two, three, five, six, seven, eight million ARR businesses than people realize. Like we did, we did this study actually, then I think we're going to publish it next week. And it basically says, um, so I looked at uh, the, like 3,000 software acquisitions being done in the last three years. And I said, okay, how many of those companies are, um, how many of those companies uh, get mainstream tech press mention when they when they get sold? And it's less than seven percent. Very few. And so people don't know. Yeah, very few. Very interesting. And are the, we we touched everything here? There you go. Holy mackerel! Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you? The best way to do it is to go to tinyseed.com/invest. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> and our and I've also on Twitter. Anar Volset started with that PhD in computing science from Newcastle in 2005, went through the remail YC journey and then exited that in 2010, then got into M&A via left, left coast R&D first and then discretion capital. Then after getting in with the microconf crew and teaming up with Rob Wong, they've launched Tiny Seed, 120 grand for 10 to 12% of equity in your company. You don't have to pay anything back unless you pay out dividends or eventually if you obviously sell the company, it's a new model. Options are every founder's best friend. Anar, thanks for the conversation. Thank you, Nathan. Always a pleasure.
These CEOs rarely give these kinds of interviews. I hit them hard, I get the data, and I wanna do it more. So if you wanna get more of this stuff, make sure you subscribe up here. And then additionally, go check out one of my other CEO interviews right now.